Good morning. Thanks, Dr. Sokolo. Thanks, Dr. Dubinsky, for having me. Like she said, my name is Ashish Patel. I'm one of the pediatric gastroenterologists here in the Dallas area. And I got the got thrown a bone since I got to argue the, the, uh, the other point. So pediatric inflammatory bowel disease, children are not just little adults. So here are my disclosures. So let's talk a little bit about some of the, some of the, issues, some of the points that Dr. Sokolow already uh, highlighted, and that is what are some of the differences between pediatric and adult inflammatory bowel disease. This is the epidemiology of pediatric inflammatory bowel disease as we understand it today. There's a slight male predominance. Severity, most disease that we diagnose, seems to be more of the moderate to severe type. The extent of the disease, it seems to be a more extensive disease, both in Crohn's disease and in ulcerative colitis. So in Crohn's disease, there's multiple locations often involved. We talk about upper tract, small bowel, large bowel, perianal disease. And in ulcerative colitis, the vast majority of ulcerative colitis that we see as pediatric gastroenterologists is pan colitis. It does have the classic triad of diarrhea, abdominal pain, and weight loss, but the additional feature that, that is important to us as, as pediatric gastroenterologists is weight and, in particular, height. Uh, lethargy, growth failure, and anorexia seem to be other issues that we commonly see with our pediatric patients. The epidemiology of adult IBD is there's a more equal distribution between males and females. Uh, the se severity can, can vary. Uh, um, many of my adult colleagues talk about mild disease that, that uh, is uh, localized rather than extensive. And so in Crohn's disease, you see patients with that classic original description uh, of, of limited ileal disease. And in ulcerative colitis, you often see, you may see patients with proctitis or just left-sided disease uh, as commonly as you may see patients with pan colitis. This is a nice recent slide from um, 2017 uh, in, the, in the British Medical Journal about the pathophysiology of inflammatory bowel disease and the wide variety of things that we know impact uh, this disease. And you know, just to highlight the, the, the more, more recent emphasis on microbiota, uh, but certainly in pediatrics as we start thinking about the differences, some of the differences that, that layer out with genetics and immunology, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So we both have scoring systems too. We have a scoring system that was the Crohn's disease, is the Crohn's disease activity index. And the pediatric guys took that and created or extended that to the pediatric Crohn's disease activity index. Well, what, what's the difference? The difference really is these features here at the bottom. The questions are largely the same, but you know, on, the adult, uh, on the adult index, it highlights the use of antidiarrheals, which we don't use uh, in, in pediatric disease. And the pediatric scale puts some objective markers in there, albumin and ESR, but also has a, uh, an emphasis on the height or the growth of the patient as an important feature of their overall disease score. So here's an example of the pediatric Crohn's disease activity index. And I just included it in the slides uh, for those of you that may not have seen it. And just so you can see the scoring system and similarly uh, the comparison to the Crohn's disease activity index. So those are both uh, in the slides. What are some of the challenges in pediatric inflammatory bowel disease? Well, one of the things is doing this sort of comprehensive evaluation. Uh, Improved Care Now is a large quality improvement collaborative that is focused on pediatric inflammatory bowel disease, and the model care guidelines for the evaluation of pediatric inflammatory bowel disease is that every patient should get an upper endoscopy, a colonoscopy, and some formal small bowel imaging, whether that be an MRE, an upper GI, capsule endoscopy. In adults, uh, often again, because disease may be uh, limited as equally as it is extensive, um, patients may uh, just get a colonoscopy or even in some cases uh, uh, just a flex sig to evaluate limited disease. Um, and that's um, some of the differences in terms of the evaluation. I know there are adult groups who, that are trying to uh, replicate some of the quality improvement work that Improved Care Now has done uh, in the world of inflammatory bowel disease. <clears throat> 
other challenges that layer out in pediatric inflammatory bowel disease, just general health literacy. We're talking to children and we're trying to convince what they need to do to the reluctant caregivers of those children. And that often makes it uh, difficult. There's not one person who's saying, okay, these are your options, and one person saying, yes, do this or do that. And we have to uh, adapt for that. You know, the pediatric, the children's hospital ask us, you know, all the websites need to be at, you know, so fourth to sixth grade reading level, and the literacy of both parents and the children that you're treating come into play. A big crux of my discussion at new diagnosis is this idea of treatment risk and benefit versus disease risk. Again, because families immediately look at some of the medications that we are planning to use and all they see are the cancer risk or the, the, the risk of the, the medication. And they don't go back and understand the real risk of the disease to the patient, to their child. Methods of non-invasive Monitoring have been important. Calprotectin, fecal calprotectin has become much more widely uh, used both in the adult population and the pediatric population, but there's an ongoing debate in the pediatric population as to what is really normal cutoffs for pediatric patients and is that different than the adult patient. Using capsule endoscopy or CT or MRE are great non-invasive methodologies, but for instance, our institution uh, it just over the last you know, three or four or five years really came up with an MRE protocol, uh, and we're not really still comfortable using CT for evaluation of inflammatory bowel disease. And now the idea of very early onset inflammatory bowel disease becomes important because now not only are we talking about the general pediatric patients, but we're talking about those patients diagnosed below the age of 10 and below the age of 6. And there are several studies that really highlighted how important genetics are in the development uh, of this idea of early onset or very early onset inflammatory bowel disease. I put in a, uh, just an immune deficiency workup. Uh, again, you guys can review this. These are some of the uh, entities that we think about that may overlap or appear like inflammatory bowel disease, but in the pediatric population, maybe a patient that you see or that transitions into adulthood that have been for a long time non-responsive to a lot of these immunomodulating medications we use, and it might be worth thinking back to when were they diagnosed, how early were they diagnosed, have they had some of this immune deficiency workup done because a lot of these patients won't get better with traditional immunomodulator therapy and in some situations would get tr uh, significantly worse. Uh, chronic granulomatous disease, um, chronic variable and, and, and uh, um, SCID, uh, FOXP3, which is uh, the, another genetic defect, and IL-10 deficiency, which many of you guys have seen uh, with the New England Journal uh, article uh, with patients with severe perianal disease. Complication risk in adults often is also interested, and there's many of these slides that talk about most adult patients present with inflammatory bowel disease, and over time, progress to stricturing or penetrating disease. But the reason I thought these were important was many of these slides talk about months from diagnosis. Months from diagnosis, 240 months. If you look at uh, a recent study from The Lancet by Dr. Kugathasen from the risk study, we're talking about time to event often in days. And so the idea that the pediatric disease may be more rapidly aggressive is an important feature of pediatric disease. So though they share the same nomenclature and some clinical similarities, pediatric and adult IBD have a variety of different influencing factors, clinical implications, and short and long-term risk. Growth in particular is one of these clinical implications that determines the type of therapy that we use in pediatrics. Pediatric inflammatory bowel disease should be approached with unique lenses, ones focused on increased severity and complexity of disease at diagnosis, growth issues, and the long-term effects of colon cancer risk, fertility, and risk of surgery. Thank you.